Hello and welcome to today's member exclusive live webinar, Understanding Your Customer's Digital Journey. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate. The presentation will last for approximately 40 minutes. You'll be able to send text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat box of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. Unfortunately, we don't send slides of the presentation. However, the webinar will be available to watch on demand via our Content Hub Exchange in the next couple of working days. I would now like to hand over to Kieran, who will be today's presenter. Over to you, Kieran. Hello. Welcome. Thanks all for, for taking the time to come and join us. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at understanding your customer's digital journey. And actually, well, it's interesting because actually what I've tried to do, uh, I think all customers go on a digital journey, but increasingly, I think they go on a real life journey as well, like in the real world. Remember that? Um, and as digital marketers, very often we, we miss a lot of what's going on. So I, I really want to delve into this and get you all thinking a little bit more deeply about these customer journeys and how they overlap. But before we do that, who am I? Well, uh, I'm Kieran Rogers. I'm a CIM course director and speaker. I've lectured at Middlesex University on their MA uh, course. I've got over 20 years of experience in digital marketing, both client side and agency side. I've worked with lots of big brands. There's just a few of them um, there, not the bore you with the details. I take, as you can see, a particularly cheesy selfie. Um, to which I, I don't apologize, that's, that's how it comes out. Uh, and I'm also the uh, host and producer of the Digital Marketing Podcast. It's a podcast we've been doing all oh, for nearly 10 years now uh, through uh, Target Internet, uh, where I'm the, 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 well, I'm, I'm the digital marketing director, actually. Um, and, and yeah, the podcast is, is an audience growing. So hopefully some of you have listened to the podcast. If you haven't, well, we'll see. We'll see how much uh, you've had a gutful of my voice by the end of this and whether you want to listen to any more of it. But there's plenty more online if you, if you want to. And I, I'd like the whole thing with the 20 years experience. It's interesting because actually what I've begun to see is that most of what I'm doing as a digital marketer is stuff that I've learned and, and discovered in the last two to three years. Um, so actually a lot of that experience kind of goes out of the window uh, a little bit. Um, but actually having... Oh, I, I spend a lot of time in sailing, and you learn there. Always keep one eye on the flag so you can see what, what direction the wind's going on uh, and, uh, and adjusting your, your course and your strategies uh, as a result of that. And I, I think that's a lot of what today's presentation is all about. So uh, I want to delve into the evolving digital environment that we find ourselves in in 2020. Now, I'm going to use a couple of really great studies that came out in January and February of uh, this year. Uh, that we've made use of. So uh, for those of you not familiar with them, there's a really good one done by We Are Social and Hootsuite, and there's another one I'm going to refer to done by SimilarWeb, uh, where they've taken lots of data from, from like, lots of big data, uh, amalgamated it all together to get a, a bit of a true uh, picture of how people are, are spending their time on, on, online. And I, I've referenced all of these um, sources in the actual slides. Um, if anybody does need the actual references, they're really super useful. There's a whole ton of stuff that I didn't need to, to, to use in this presentation. Um, in particular, I really love the We Are Social study because actually they produce it every year um, and you can begin to compare and contrast how things have, have shifted, which is a lot of fun in itself. Um, okay, if you're not convinced, you, you're, not, you're not into data enough, uh, that, that's fine. But if you're like me and, and love a bit of data that you can compare and contrast, they're really, really good. Before we delve into that, though, I want to give you all an image. Um, you'll have all, I'm sure, seen the David Attenborough uh, and, and similar uh, animal documentaries. I want you to imagine either a lion or a puma stalking its prey. Yeah, have we all got that? So you imagine that. And what's interesting, when, if you've ever watched any movies of lions or pumas or any big cat actually stalking its prey, what I think is amazing about them is they have this absolutely unwavering focus on their objective. Now, <laughs> in, in, in the wild world, their objective is to, to eat whatever they're, they're, they're sizing up. Um, but I think as, as digital marketers, there's a lot that we can, can learn from that. Actually having an unwavering focus on our objective, I think, is a lot of what digital marketing is all about. But what I'm going to explore here is I think is particularly the digital part of the marketer is, is very often like not looking at the right thing. Like Very often we think we're focused on our objective, but actually we're just looking at shadows 
that are cast from the real world. And if a big cat was to, you know, conduct its its hunt like that, um, well, it would end up going hungry, right? Because it's it's going to kind of miss the line. Um, so just to keep that analogy in the back of your mind as we explore some of the reasons I'm going to use to to kind of justify that. I think that uh, don't get me wrong, digital is amazing, and there's lots that you can measure, but there's a lot that you can't measure, and a lot of the time I think we are looking at literally shadows of what's actually going on. Um, and if we're too focused on on the digital side, we're going to miss a lot. Uh, so what do we do online? Well, uh, this is from the, uh, the We Are Social uh, Hootsuite um, study. Um, and actually, you know, like 90% of our activity is watching videos online. Like no surprises there. 51% um, of that watching uh, video logs or vlogs, if you like. 70% uh, listening to streaming music services. 47% listening to online radio stations. And 41% listening to podcast. I think what's interesting about all of those major online activities is that actually they're all kind of hard to track in many respects. I know we can put, you know, tracking on videos that we've got on our website and stuff and you do get like video analytics and stuff, but actually measuring through from that kind of content through to conversion does present a few challenges, but that's what the majority of, of, of people are, are doing. A majority of the time isn't spent online doing activities that, you know, we would consider as marketers an actual conversion in a lot of instances. So um, how do we view the actual web? Well, no surprises here. Uh, this is the, again, from the We Are Social study. 53% uh, of the web pages uh, that were consumed by web browsers in December of 2019 were on a mobile. That was up 8.6% on the same month in a previous year, so December 2018. Uh, laptops and desktops uh, lost a portion, uh, but we're still using those a lot. And tablet computers, definitely on the decline. I think as mobile phones just get easier to use and, and, and the screens more easily to zoom in and out and respond on, on various web, different websites, um, less and less do we actually even have a need for a tablet computer, but they're still there. Um, and, and no surprises, but uh, it would turn out that playing games on like other devices uh, is much more entertaining than trying to browse the web on them, which <laughs> clearly isn't, isn't a trend that we see uh, any growth on. And it really doesn't surprise me if you've ever tried to use uh, some of these other devices for browsing the web. They're really not, not a great experience. Okay, so, okay, so mobile is, a, is, a, is the, the main window that people are, are consuming uh, their content through. Um, what's interesting is when you look at this, this are taken from the similar web uh, study and their 2020 digital uh, trends report. Um, mobile has nowhere near the kind of visit duration that we see on desktop devices. So effectively, if, if more and more people are using mobile devices, actually our attention spans are are lowering. Well, sort of. It, it, it gets complicated, doesn't it? Because actually we know that people are on multiple device journeys. You know, I might start my journey on, on a mobile device and switch around to, you know, a tablet or a desktop or, or really, if I'm honest about it, whatever, you know, device suits me to use at that moment in my time. The problem is it makes it harder for us as marketers to, to monitor those, those journeys. A lot of our tracking uh, a lot of the analytics tracking is very reliant on cookies. Where do those cookies get placed? Well, in specific browser cookie folders. Uh, so, you know, even just cross-browser tracking is hard enough, let alone uh, cross-device. Cross and although some of the big players, and particularly Google with Chrome and Apple with um, Safari, have made steps to, uh, you know, pull uh, cross-device uh, cookies across, uh, a lot of people are still using uh, a lot more than one browser and a lot more than one device. Um, the other thing I think is really interesting is this global use of voice search. And, and this, some of the figures here really surprised me. In some cases, they're almost double what uh, I was looking at sort of same period last year. Um, you know, globally, up to 43% of users are saying they regularly use or certainly using each month uh, voice interfaces to, to interact with the web. And I think, you know, that's going to cause, you know, a bit of a, bit of a shift really in how people are actually um, using it. You know, if you've got a lot of people using voice commands to navigate through through the web, certain things like questions are gonna be so much more important. And indeed, the search engine optimization world is definitely responding to that. Um, you know, people are doing a lot more queries in natural language now. So, you know, you don't have to jump to ask Jeeves like we did years ago 
uh, to start asking real life questions. Google's more than happy to, to, to handle that. And you know, the, the speech assistants and speech, uh, the voice assistants and voice activated devices are very, very good at interpreting our voice commands. Um, UK is lacking a little bit lower numbers there, I thought, for this study. That surprised me, like 28%, um, but that's still a big increase than what it was in the previous year. And the prediction is that these are only going to continue to grow. Uh, if any of you haven't used like either a, a Google Assistant or an uh, Amazon uh, Alexa device, definitely like my recommendation is get hold of one because your audiences and consumers potentially are uh, making use of these. And I think it's great to, to, to get a, uh, an idea of how they work and how useful they are. Um, they do get used in a, in a different way, though. And actually, if we, you know, if we have, a, have, a, have a look at the two main um, players, I think, again, you have to be careful with the stats because actually that, that earlier graph that I showed you is very much looking at all voice commands, not just specifically questions asked to, to these uh, digital assistants. Um, but these things are great and do give answers to almost every question. The question I have for you all is if a significant portions of your audience are you know, using these devices to navigate the, the web, how certain are you that your analytics tracking is accurately ca you know, capturing that? Um, you know, as far as I'm aware, these things don't need to download or uh, make use of any JavaScript that's on your website. And increasingly what the search engines are doing is they're pulling content from our websites and serving them up within the search results. So actually, you could be reaching a lot of people that never even need to touch your website. You know, you only need to look at what's happened within the travel industry, um, particularly with like flights and hotels. And, you know, they're a whole industry where I don't actually need to visit my provider's website once. You know, I can book a, a flight through any uh, flight operator, all within the safe uh, confines of, of my search engine. Um, and I, I, th I think increasingly, as people start to find ways of using you know, voice assistants uh, to navigate through the web, it's going to be harder and harder to track. Now, uh, this, this is special, right? A little drum roll for this one, definitely. This is the uh, Smart Insights did this, um, Dr. Dave Chafee, um, amazing guy, brilliant marketer, and definitely check out Smart Insights website. So many useful resources there, big fan of their work. Smart Insights did this diagram a few years ago, and for me, it represents a, a really brilliant 10,000 foot view of, of digital marketing. So, you know, we're all focused on content marketing. The idea is that we come up with lots of really great content, blogs, webinars, videos, infographics, audio, ebooks, all that good stuff. Um, and they get pushed into our content hub there in the middle, right? So we're publishing, we call it a content hub because it, in most cases, this is a website, but it, it could easily be a, you know, a portal or, or even an app. Uh, actually in, in today's environment. How do we get stuff or people to look at that stuff? Well, from two different directions digitally, actually, at the moment, it, it, you've got the marketing outposts and influencer websites on the right-hand side. Um, they'll certainly link to content that's really, really good um, and share that with their audiences. But then we've also got the search engines, so Bing and Google spidering through our website, working out what it's uh, uh, about. What a lot of people do, though, is they're not pulling a close enough kind of a view of how much those search engines interact with and relate to those marketing outposts and influencer websites. So, you know, they are making use of data in social networks and news sites and influencer blogs and portal and partner sites to work out what's popular and what's not. So you can't actually, I don't think, in today's environment, have success in one without necessarily having success in another. And we all know how important backlinks are, right? But, you know, if the search engines are only really going on account of the, the backlinks, they're never going to be a ranking stuff that's, that's literally just happening now. So they're, they're very much reliant on signals from elsewhere to work out what's popular and what's not. Um, and so all these things are sending us traffic, but for, for, for in different ways. Um, and it all gets measured on our analytics, let's say, whether it's come through from a social network or from, from, from Google or from Bing even. Um, but we don't necessarily know how much those two uh, kind of environments are actually interacting uh, with one another. And I think increasingly it's really, really important. So, you know, how do we go about viewing our content um, and making sure that we're you know, performing effectively? Well, one of the ways is to use a very simple marketing funnel. And this is something we recommend for all of our, our marketing students. And I'm particularly fond of the, the funnel on the left there. This is, this is Google's take on the marketing funnel. I'm, I'm sure you've all seen various iterations of this kind of classic sales funnel. 
Um, but the way Google look at it, I think, is, is quite brilliant. They've taken a very customer-centric view of it. So they've broken it down into four stages. And although we, as marketers, we know, and as salespeople, we know there can be many more stages within uh, more complex sales. Effectively, most sales funnels break down into these four these four groups. So you have the C stage, where you know very much it's inspiring and connecting with those audiences initially. You have a think stage where we're looking to inform, educate, and influence. There's a do stage where we tend to want to drive action, and then there's a care stage right at the end where. Well, I, I think the aim needs to be pampering and, and rewarding those customers because they've already gone through that do stage. And when I look at people's content marketing plans, very often I see a lot of content focused around that do stage and not enough at <laughs> the see, think, and, and care stages. And I think, you know, that's a mistake. I think as marketers, we are potentially leaving a lot of money on the table if we do that. You see, you don't just n normally jump straight to the do. Normally, there's a little bit of, of romancing and schmoozing uh, to take a, a relationship analogy um, and probably push it too far. We'll, we'll see what you think. Um, but, you know, you, you can't do that. You, you have to have that content regularly at all of the four stages because if you don't, then it's hard for people to, or harder for people to make the, the, the jump uh, through through those various different, different hoops. And so I'm a big fan of making sure, you know, when I look at a content marketing plan that I've got a good amount every week or every month of see, of think, of do, and of care content. And that care content is one of the most neglected areas, actually. All too often as marketers, once we've got people to do what we want them to do on our website, so we think that's it. Yeah, job's good. You have someone else's problem now. And it's such a mistake because here, here we've got an audience of people who, you know, they actually love what we do enough to, to actually buy. And there's so much more you could do to pamper and reward those people. And what numerous studies have, have shown is that when you do that, actually those people can become real advocates and influence the see, think, do, and care stages of the user journey. So I just wanted to share that with you. I think it's a beautifully simple way of viewing, you know, an otherwise quite quite complex thing uh, where you look at the, the overall scheme of things. Okay, so we all have this similar problem, right, with our content marketing. There's what the brand wants to tell people, and there's what those audiences we want to reach are actually prepared to engage with. And I think all too often those things are miles apart. So, you know, the smart money is actually on bridging this gap with a real understanding-driven driven strategy. And for me, that's kind of where, you know, this, this earlier diagram comes in. I'll just zoom back here. Um, because you see here, you know, over on the left-hand side, we should be looking at the monitoring and listening on social media and looking at the participation to see what people are actually engaging with. And also looking at what content is actually getting the necessary traffic and, and delivering a, a good return on investment. So why? So we can do more of the stuff that works and less of the stuff that, 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 that doesn't. And that's kind of really key to, you know, getting, getting this balance right. I think all too often we push things that, Really? I mean, just look through your last three or four emails and how much of it do you, do you honestly think your customers would be super, super excited about? And how much of it would just be meh? You know, we, we don't want them to go meh. Um, there's too much of that in the world. There's a tsunami of content out there. We want them to go, ooh, this looks really, really good. You know, this really answers what's in it for me. Um, and uh, I think all too often we, we neglect that. So. The, the strategy I like to follow is to, you know, when I'm when I'm looking for potential um, customers, I like to, you know, think about well, who are these people, and then look at marketing personas, um, and think about where might they be hanging out online, and would it be appropriate for me to to reach out to them to them there, and you know, you literally can make use of lots of what I term social media outposts and online outposts, where you know the fish that you want to catch are. They're hanging out. They're chatting with friends. But the thing is that they're not really there to, you know, nobody rushes to social media so they can buy stuff. You know, they're there normally on all different networks for different different reasons. Um, but I think, you know, the, the strategy here is kind of leaving nice breadcrumb trails of, of, of juicy content that you've actually got on your website that, that actually fulfills needs that, that those fish have, you know, wherever they are. And to do it in a, you know, a, a platform native way. You know, there are certain ways to do things on Snapchat and there are certain ways to do things on Pinterest or Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever the channel is. Um, and you need to be well versed in, in those in order to get any traction. But essentially what we're doing is trying to pull them back, I think, to our to our hub, 
right, to our to our app or to our to our website. Why? Because actually, they, these things are much better designed for you know positioning the the customer into a an environment where they can do the things that we want them to do. You know, whatever your goal is, whether it's you know uh, more engagement with your website content, or whether it's actual you know lead acquisition forms being filled out, or even actual purchases being being made, um, much much easier for that to be um, used and, and controlled within your own uh, website. And um, you know, it's not just digital. This you know, there's there's a lot of real world stuff that goes on as well. Why do I say that? Well, because actually people have got their attention on lots of non-digital things all the time, and I know. I know that you know a lot of them are you know very very digitally driven, but that doesn't mean they're completely blind to everything else. And I, I just feel, I do, I feel quite strongly that people have thrown the baby out with the bathwater a little bit. Um, early on, when you were a first adopter of some of these channels, you could have tremendous success with them because there weren't enough voices you know shouting uh, messages, so you could get a lot of attention. I think I think that wave's passed. I think now you know all these places are extremely loud and uh, extremely more challenging to get your message across um, particularly if it's not aligned with what with what the fish you're trying to catch are actually interested in the first in the first place and there's definitely a lot of wor word of mouth that's going on so that leads me nicely to taking a look at what some of our digital measurement systems in particular analytics can't measure uh, there's been a massive increase in the use of ad blockers, and I, I don't think that's going to going to stop. Uh, again, here I'm referring to the figures in the uh, 2020 We Are Social Hootsuite report. Um, worldwide, like 49% of users aged 16 to 64 are actually using uh, ad blockers to, to block advertising. I, from our own uh, experience, uh, the younger audiences, and we, we do a lot of stuff at universities, um, teaching and training uh, students and postgraduate students there. Um, and for sure, it, it does seem uh, actually in some cases the instances of ad blockers can be much, much higher with certain demographic groups. But you know, for, for across the board, um, for them to be hovering around 50%, it actually means that in a lot of cases, getting your message across using you know, traditional digital advertising is becoming much more of a challenge. Why? Well, I think in a way, marketers are kind of responsible to, for this. You know, we, we, we forget that all important what the users are prepared to engage with, and a lot of content providers. Um, particularly publishers, have gone so far squeezing adverts into their content that actually it becomes quite hard to see the content that you were there to look at in the first place. And I'm sure you can all think of examples of that. Not everybody, granted. There are some sites that do it very sensitively and, and, and tread that path carefully. But I think all too often the users are uh, having their experience crippled by ads and therefore just blocking them out. You know, don't do that to me. Do stuff for me kind of thing. When I'm thinking about all the different platforms that are out there, I like to think of social media platforms as parties. And I, yeah, I share this analogy with you because I hope it's useful. I think, oh gosh, there's so much that we could talk about any one of these platforms. I don't want to get bogged down in that. But what I would say is that you know probably all of you have access to uh, a lot of these platforms. You're probably all on Facebook. That doesn't necessarily mean if I wanted to reach you in a B2B uh, context that Facebook would be the perfect place to reach you. Right? I think the, the platforms are like parties. We, you know, we're there to, hey, be social. That's why it's called social media. Um, and generally, we're there to interact with the people that are on those um, platforms in some form of capacity. But it's, you know, the parties differ quite widely. The Facebook party is very different to the Twitter party. Uh, and both of those places are very, very different to the LinkedIn party. You know, a Facebook, oh, Facebook would be a weird party, wouldn't it? Like, just imagine if you've got everybody in your face, everybody that's attached to your Facebook profile, got them in a room. Uh, yeah, obviously, you know, with some fizzy wine and some twiglets and some cheese and pineapple on sticks, you know, it's got to be classy, a classy affair, right? Uh, with all those people there, but you would have a really weird group of people from, from like, from school, from like jobs you did years ago, through to, you know, aging family members that have just discovered uh, Facebook and and think it's very very cool and down with the kids, and it it would be quite a dysfunctional party if you did that. And I think increasingly that's why, um, particularly in the UK and in the West, a lot of us don't don't tend to be very active on Facebook because um, we can't particularly control, you know, what kind of environment that we're communicating with. LinkedIn's a much better example. LinkedIn's much more like a business networking party. And, you know, the norms of business networking kind of work there. So I, I, I do cringe when I see people putting cat memes and <laughs> stuff on, on LinkedIn. It's like, oh, not really appropriate for this kind of environment. But, um, but yeah, every so often you, you come across it. Um, similar things with like the Snapchat or the Instagram party. You know, they, 
when we're there, we're there to behave in certain ways and to sh- share certain stuff with certain people. And you can't just kind of crash in with your own, with your own agenda on it. Um, when we look at the social networks we're actually using, really interesting this, and this is one I monitor every year, um, the, the, the growth rates in, in different platforms. Facebook's kind of come back, actually. They seem to be getting a lot of uh, new uh, kind of traffic acquisition in um, kind of overseas um, territories, particularly around Africa and, and Asia and what have you. But um, they're, certainly they're, so their overall growth and, and unique visitors uh, in, in millions is, is, is going on uh, and up for sure. Um, YouTube's a bit of a dark horse. Check, definitely check out the YouTube um, stats in this because that, that really surprised me. But the thing that I found particularly interesting in this context is the growth in things like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and WeChat. Um, you know, these are, are much more kind of private type networks. You know, it, the, the, those, those platforms aren't necessarily for mass communication to everybody. You know, you think about your own use in, in the UK, you know, WhatsApp's one of the, one of the big ones. And most of us have got access to it. We tend to you know, talk with specific groups uh, for specific means. It's quite, generally quite informal. Not, 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 I've not seen many you know, business-focused groups within, within that, or certainly not, not within my own networks. Um, and these platforms are growing at a tremendous rate. Right? And actually, what fascinated me was last year, um, just, just over a year ago now, uh, Mr. Mark from uh, Facebook actually came out and said, I, uh, as I think about the future of the internet, I believe a privacy-focused communications platform will become even more important than today's open platforms. And that, that gobsmackingly amazing moment for me, that the man who has numerous times been, you know, quite famously said uh, he thought privacy was dead, now saying, actually, <laughs> privacy is where it's at. Um, so if you haven't read that, that kind of open letter from him, definitely, definitely dig it out. It's an interesting read. And he is sat on an awful lot of data. We, we all know that. You know. Um, and I think what's interesting is when you look at you know, how our behavior is, is, is shifting. Um, you know, we, we've seen this over the last four or five years. Um, actually, the amount of social sharing that our content gets is, is, is a lot short. And I, I just really wanted to throw this open to you guys, right? So when you publish a... a uh, uh, you know, content and push it out through social media. What what kind of numbers of actual social shares, so people sharing it on the social platforms publicly, do you actually get? And I'm going to invite Ali back in, um, so she can read out some of the some of the um, uh, uh, re- results that you're, you're sending in. So just just text text us through on the chat there. Ali, are you there? I am indeed. I'm just waiting for some um, from a, some results Excellent. to come in, so I will report back as soon as uh, as soon as any come in. So at the moment we've had uh, 15 to 20, and then mm-hmm. um, another person has reported five to 10 shares from Facebook, and we've had yeah. another answer which is less than 100. Um, yeah. So quite a lot of variation in there. Yeah, and you um, get that because. Obviously, you know, different size audiences are going to get get different size, you know, numbers of numbers of, of, of shares and stuff. Um, for those people that have shared the, the the figures, would you say that you've seen it drop over the last few years? Like, is it what it used to be? A lot of people have said very few single digits, uh, single yeah. figures or small percentages. Yeah, 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 and, that, and that's generally my experience. You know, when we straw poll um, people, it's kind of you know less than a, a handful in most cases. Which is kind of frustrating, right? And just to kind of like move this forward, that uh, Buzz Sumo did a really interesting report on this back in 2018, uh, where they literally monitored uh, a lot of social social sharing uh, across their their networks, um, and actually they found that overall the social sharing had kind of halved over a, like an 18 month period or so. Um, the question that I've been exploring is is has it has it halved or has our ability to actually measure uh, it half because actually and here's some good news for you i'll I'll put it to all of you that your social content that you're pushing out there unless it's particularly dull (laughs) is probably doing a lot lot more for your for your marketing efforts um than you actually realize and i I need to qualify and explore that so one of the reasons is this growth in global global chat i mean this is this is a lovely um diagram that hootsuite we are social report published where 
you can actually see you know what the most dominant um, chat networks are within within different countries. So you can see over in in Asia, um, uh, certainly China, it's all about WeChat. Uh, in the UK and, and Europe, much more about what WhatsApp. In Northern America, it's much more about Facebook Messenger. Um, so just just hold that thought, right? So we're all kind of definitely there's definitely massive growth in in live chat, um, like well chat apps between people. Um, the, the interesting thing is, and, and this was a great uh, little piece of research done by uh, Get Social, um, and you can get the, the full resource here. Um, but they looked at the number of like social shares that were, well, it's called dark sharing. It sounds a lot more sinister than it is, and some of you who listen to the podcast will have heard us talk about this. Um, basically, when it comes to analytics tracking, a lot of what we want to track doesn't get tracked the way we want it to. So, for example, at the moment I step out of, you know, an HTTP or HTTPS uh, website um, and start sharing messages that I found on social media with, for example, people that are on WhatsApp or Facebook, or even actually just sharing stuff via SMS. You know, I, I do that quite a bit with if I see cool stuff. I think individuals would 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 like. You know, that's that's one of my defaults personally. Um, the, you know, those messages aren't HTTPS or HTTP, they're, they're, they're apps. But they don't provide your website analytics with any referral information. Um, and actually what happens is it goes into the, the world's most useless, in my opinion, analytics segment, which is none direct, which is kind of, you know, it's not particularly good at all. Um, and similar problems with email. If you have links in email that aren't, don't have tracking codes on them, um, you're going to um, see a, a similar problem. And, you know, with a lot of those mobile applications as well, they're not going to provide website referral information. And so we just don't know necessarily how our stuff's being shared. So how does dark social translate into analytics? Well, the majority of it, like the actual direct traffic, is going to end up in that none stroke none direct segment. But I'd also argue, actually, a lot of it ends up seeping through into other areas. Just because I've seen something doesn't necessarily mean I follow the link. Um, that, that's there, and I will follow you know whatever's most convenient to me in terms of device, browser, um, and, and and platform. Uh, I'll follow links as they suit me. So actually, you know, stuff that you get, you've, you've achieved on social media can end up flowing into your organic results, your referral results, your even your AdWords results, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the solution, uh, I think, is to make much better use of of UTM codes. And for any of you not doing this. Um, this is a great way of better demonstrating your um, social media return on investment. Um, this is uh, the URL campaign builder from, from Google. Um, just Google your Google URL builder or Google UTM builder and you'll find it. Um, and here I've put in the campaign source of Facebook, the medium of social, and the campaign name, which is very much the blog post that I'm, I'm trying to promote there. And you see what it does is it gives you along the bottom of the screen uh, a URL to, to share. Very often I'll shorten those with you know, something like bit.ly or, or, or hourly, um, so it doesn't look quite so long and, and, and complicated. But you know, when that gets uh, shared via any dark social, I at least have a measure of where it originally came from. Um, so it's, it's very effective from that perspective. Um, but it's still not a complete solution because a lot of people don't do that. Um, and actually, this is an interesting case in point. So this is um, from one of, uh, well, it's, it's a business that I've um, been helping for quite a few years now since I worked at an agency. Um, and I, I can't share with you who the business is, but I can share this data with you. So you can see there some quite interesting patterns. So they, over this this February, they had a jump of 85% of, of more users, but their revenue jumped 523%. And you can see from the traffic uh, graph at the top, there were two spikes, one on the 4th of February and one on the 23rd of February. And when I look at my analytics data and try and work out what's caused it, I just haven't got a clue. I mean, you know, looking at the numbers, it looks, referral looks interesting. It's grown the most in terms of a percentage. But what's happened that's caused all these channels to, 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 to go up? Well, two things, actually. So uh, I can tell you that on the 4th of February, uh, they got some coverage on This Morning, you know, that lovely ITV show. Uh, and, uh, and that sent them a big old burst of, 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 of traffic, uh, which converted. But the traffic came through lots of different channels. And then on the 23rd of February, something really magical happened. When I, when I got the initial report, I thought, something's gone wrong, something's broken, this can't be true. Because in one day, their website took nearly nearly 40 grand worth of sales. This is from a retailer, as you can see, the average there is like about 15. 
So to take 14, or like 40 grand in one day was phenomenal um, for them. And actually there, again, no evidence in the analytics where it's come from. You know, is it, is it are we doing much better on SEO? You know, that organic traffic and conversions are up, or is it, is it our PPC? You know, that's, that's hoofing it, 400% increase. So those guys would be celebrating. No, it was none of those things. It was, it was one mention in a Sunday newspaper. Right? It drove like literally 4,000 people to a website to buy a £10 product. Um, and actually, that, that growth continued for like a week afterwards. And the, the reason for sharing this with you is to really make the point, look, a lot of what actually happens in the real world has a massive effect on what happens digitally. And we don't know it. You know, we're just not able to see it. So one of the most powerful things I think you can do is to start using the most powerful button. It's the most understated button in your analytics. And it's that just underneath February 2018 there, you can see that little triangle I've put the red arrow to. Um, that is the annotations uh, drawer. You can open it up and you can add annotations. And you see here I've added an annotation to the, uh, the 11th of January there for that big spike to explain what it is. And I think we all need to do this. Now, th this, this actually was uh, some, <laughs> it was a, <laughs> It was a bit of a, it was a bit of non-event actually. Um, it drove three times the amount of traffic in one day, um, and I couldn't understand why because it was all going towards a, a quite short article we wrote called "What Is uh, Google Preferred." Um, the the real world uh, kind of story that had happened around this um, was there was a, a very popular YouTuber called Paul Logan, Logan Paul, I think his name was, and he he'd done a, a fairly uh, awful uh, video um, documenting a very sad place in Japan called Suicide Forest. I'm not going to go into that, but if you want to read more about it, you can see it there. Uh, as a result, lots of brands associated with him wanted to distance themselves from him. Um, and indeed, Google announced that he was being removed from Google Preferred. <laughs> so that came out, and everybody went, what is Google Preferred? And they Googled it, and our web page came top. So we got massive amount of traffic from, from that. Now, I annotated it because we need to understand what caused that. Actually, in this instance, it was a negative effect because it caused a load of traffic that just was not interested in They came, they discovered what Google Preferred was, and they left again <laughs> without doing anything that I wanted them to do. And that obviously ends up diluting your numbers. But like having a measure of this and having it recorded, super, super useful. So what can you choose annotations to do? Well, I use them to help tell data stories. Any significant offline event, like good or bad PR news, TV coverage, trade shows, an event you speak at, store openings, change of agency, if you have it, like, annotate that for sure. Um, any significant sales uh, events online, every, every email newsletter you're doing, annotate it. Because you begin to learn, actually, when stuff ha happens in one channel, it has knock-on effects in, in lots of others. Um, so, you know, make use of those. Um, and, you know, you can also make use of Bitly uh, analytics. I'm a big fan of, of, of Bitly, and we um, tend to, to use this. It, again, you can see here the degree of, of how much our own uh, social media sharing. I only use Bitly links for, for social media sharing, um, and anything up to 80 to 90% of our uh, traction that we get happens through dark social. And you can see evidence of it there. So um, uh, definitely worth using that because it gives you a bit more of a measure of it. And then finally, I, I just want to open your eyes to some of the cool tools that are now uh, available. Uh, if you haven't already, definitely take a look at Facebook attribution. If you go to business.facebook.com when you're logged into your website, um, and you can you can see it there. It open up the big the big mega menu. It's it's there in, in attribution. You have to set it up, and it takes a couple of days for it to to get some meaningful data. But there's some very cool stuff that you can can do with it. So it actually gives you. Uh, some really flexible attribution models uh, to play around with. So here I've uh, chosen even credit uh, across a 28-day click or visit uh, and 28-day impression. So what does that mean? Well, if they click or visit my website over a 28-day period and if they've been shown any advertising on Facebook within a 28-day period, um, this will track kind of what they end up, up doing. And what I love about it is it, it gives you, if you're doing any significant advertising on Facebook or Instagram, or even if you've just experimented with that, you know, you might have discovered, oh, it doesn't really do what we want it to do, you know, especially when you're looking at your Google Analytics results. Um, and actually, this gives you a, a, another way of looking at it. So we did some uh, campaigns for this particular brand in the run-up to Christmas. We spent just around 600 quid on the Facebook and Instagram advertising for them. And in analytics, 
uh, last click attribution, it looked like that had generated £614. So like I'd made 14 quid, but I've got all my costs to take out of that. So it was a, a bit of an embarrassment, really. You think, oh, well, maybe we'll knock that on the head and not bother. But actually, when you look at it from a wider attribution model uh, and measure a little bit broadly, and this, this is using Facebook's attribution modelling, you can see there that actually that £600 spend actually resulted in you know nearly five uh, five and a half grand's worth of, of, of of actual sales the difference is and you know why the difference well you know this is looking much broader uh, anybody that got reached by those campaigns what did they what did they actually eventually go on to, to do um, and in you know looking at those in figures you go oh, do you know what this is good you see particularly anything display related happens quite early on within the user journey um, very often they will come and convert when it suits them at a later date and you, you know your standard analytics tracking won't pick that up um, and just to show you uh, some of the other aspects of, of this, and, and don't like make no bones about it. Like check it out. I haven't been able to show you everything here, but you can see where you know how other channels are interacting on a wider attribution model uh, as well. It's super super interesting. Um, I love the the fact that you actually get multi device conversion paths as well. So here we're able to see that 25% of the conversions on desktops actually occurred after people had interacted on with our ads on their mobile devices, which is hugely exciting. Um, and you start getting stats like that. And so now I can start to play around with, okay, if we do more, uh, what's the end result? Does it, does it grow, does it grow the, 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 the sales and conversion? Don't forget, you can look at your know, multi-channel funnel and um, uh, wider attribution models within Google Analytics if you dig into the reports. Big fans at Target Internet of the GA multi-channel funnel report. You get a lovely overview where you can see, you know, for everybody that converted, which channels did they touch? And also, you can do that model comparison between first interaction, last interaction. It's well worth doing that. But you know, even this doesn't have a view on how many people were shown my adverts in Facebook. Um, it's, it's kind of classic, really. With all these attribution tools, I find whoever the tool provider is, it tends to benefit them and make them a little bit good. So obviously, Google Analytics is particularly good for you know seeing how Google Organic and Google Ads uh, traffic performs. They've kind of got that sewn up. Um, but I think you know we all need to, as marketers, take things a little bit wider. So just to wrap up, I've got some awesome planning resources and measurement uh, stuff for you. There's a little bit of a model. I'm not going to go into it too much detail, but I think all the businesses, all marketers should focus on their, like see their target clearly. Remember my lion and my puma stalking its prey. You know, are you all looking at your business objectives daily? And have you aligned your marketing objectives with those business objectives? And when those change, are you, are you changing tact and changing tactics and reviewing everything you're doing? And this is just a simple like dashboard. Anybody could build this. You could do this on the back of an envelope if you really wanted to, or you know, Google Spreadsheets, or, or, or you know, any of the online um, tools. Just just Excel if you wanted to, where you actually every week you're looking at the percentage contribution different channels are actually making overall, and also looking at some of that good old-fashioned last-click data as well to really get a steer on how the channels are all interacting uh, with one another. And if you're doing this and you're annotating a lot of the real-world uh, events that are inevitably massively impacting on what's happening on your digital channels, um, you really can uh, kind of adjust uh, and focus. You're looking at the actual prey that you're after, not just some of the digital shadows that get cast by real-world uh, events. Um, if you want to get more on this, have a look at the targetinternet.com digital-strategy-measurement-framework. Um, you can go there, and there's a whole article uh, on this. Um, you can read in detail how you go about doing it. Um, and that's it. I think it's just about in time. So um, that's kind of everything that I wanted to uh, say. I've also I've thrown in here, obviously check out the podcast. I've also thrown in here a link to our digital marketing toolkit, which is a list of, oh gosh, over 50 of our favorite digital marketing tools to help you uh, navigate the, the digital landscape and do lots of cool stuff. But I'll throw it over to you. Has anybody got any questions? Thanks very much, Kieran. So we're now going to answer questions that have been submitted. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions via the chat box in the attendee control panel. So our first question is a nice general one for you, Kieran. What is mm. the most valuable KPI to measure for a social media campaign? <laughs> I can't answer that because it depends what you're trying to achieve. You depend, depending on what I want to achieve will depend what I want to actually, actually measure. So you know, I bring you back to this, and this is why we we encourage marketers to to map this out. So you know, here I've got my primary business goals and objectives. I've set up some marketing business objective uh, marketing objectives with it within that. 
and then I will pick the various digital channels and real world channels that I'm going to use to hit that objective. And then based on what that objective is, I'm going to pick out, you know, what the what those all important KPI uh, uh, KPIs are. You know, for some of you, if you're a brand, it's going to be much more about engagement. You're not necessarily selling direct to the consumer. Um, but if you're, you know, if you are, you know, you might have some, you know, hard and fast metrics in there. Um, I'm, I love to look at that percentage contribution, which really comes um, from, let me go back a couple, uh, that multi-channel funnel uh, report. You just go into the multi-channel funnel overview and you can get those percentages because it, it does tell you a lot on how these things are interplaying. Um, but, you know, equally, I might keep an eye on, you know, some of, the, some of these um, reports, depending on what my strategy is and how I'm going about doing it. There's a bit of a cop out, I know, but that's the only way. Like you've got to ask, look, what 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 are we measuring is one thing, but why are we measuring it is <laughs> the more important question that trumps that. Well, what are we trying to achieve? And it all comes back to see your target clearly and hit it until you hit it. Like you know, mark it like a like a lion or a puma, uh, a lot more. Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, and we've had another question um, about analytics, specifically for voice search, which you mentioned at the beginning mm. of the presentation. What level yeah. of analytics or tracking is available for voice search at this point? I don't know of much, to be honest, because in order for your analytics to work, it has to fire JavaScript on your website. And, you know, more often than not, the voice search results are being pulled off of your website and um, being displayed on someone else's websites you you know you're not going to get much of a much of a response now and it, do you know what we should throw that open has anybody got any because I, I i don't know i've not not come across it voices is hard to measure right has anybody got any any leads on that has anybody suggest anything i will let you know if anyone does yeah let's know much let's go that. on to another question um, yeah yeah, absolutely. So um, I know this is something that you feel very passionate about, last click attribution. Um, and someone's <laughs> asked, are there any re resources that you would recommend to understand a bit more about last click attribution and attribution models in general? Um, Avinash Kuzik, Kuzak, I never know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but he's a genius. He is a genius. And he does a thing called Occam's Razor. That's O C C A M R. A Z O R Occam's Razor. It's his blog. He's brilliant. He's an absolute genius with this, and he's he's actually Google's analytics evangelist. Um, and like study his. I mean, his blogs are a uh, gosh, they're a zen-like way of life. If you're in my in my opinion, but they're really really good. I can't can't recommend him highly highly enough. Um, and it actually it was him that came up with the C think do care model. You know, he's he's brilliant at taking complex things and making them much much simpler. Um, but, you know, he, he's got some great resources on the evils of last click attribution. I, I say that um, a little bit tongue in cheek. Last click attribution definitely has its place and I use that a lot, but it's not the only show in town. And there is other data that you need to look at. You know, if you just follow last click, you will inevitably end up funneling a lot more money and resources into what are kind of classic goal hanging channels, you know, like things like pay per click. Sorry, guys, if you do that. but it is quite easy to get results in that because it's the first thing that appears underneath your customer's fat, lazy thumbs. You know, what's wrong with this? It's become effort, an effort to flick down the screen. And we're, in a lot of cases, we just, I just, you know, if, it's gonna, if the advert's going to give me what I need, I'll just click on it. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, um, and also like affiliate marketing, terrible as a, like a goal hanging, uh, just hoover up people that were going to buy anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, keeping a broader eye on your, your KPIs, um, and seeing how stuff looks from a first click analysis. Um, but, you know, all of these attribution models can be quite confusing. You think, well, which one's right? Well, they're all right. They all have their place. They're all measuring different things, though. Um, so spend time with Avinash um, and learn more about that. And obviously, you can listen to the digital marketing podcast. I think this will be a, a theme we'll be covering a lot more over the coming months as well. Perfect. Great stuff. And someone else has asked about taking these insights that you learn from the customer's digital journey and applying them mm. um, to the business as a whole. Do you have any advice for kind of sharing insights um, that are taken from the digital journey with the organization and helping to build strategies based on that rather than vice versa? I think uh, annotate. <laughs> annotate more um, because you will begin to take your data and you can tell a story with it. You know, I think all too often we're shoving what look like very compelling and very convincing analytics graphs and charts. 
in front of lots of people who really don't necessarily know what they're looking at. Um, and it's very easy to, to think you know which way's up and which way's down. But if that's your only view, you know, you're missing a, a bigger picture. So annotate a lot. You know, when you create annotations, you will begin to see patterns in your data. You know, even, especially when you start to annotate offline, like real world events as well. Honestly, you'll be really shocked and surprised. You know, I work with one organization that, you know, funnily enough, their emails did amazingly well once every three months. Why? Because actually there was a guy on a different team sending out a two, three 300,000 mail shot to, you know, committed customers. But the digital team were never looking at that. In fact, it, it went down like a French, French kiss at a family reunion when I highlighted the fact that we just had a massive mail shot gone up. Maybe it was what David over in the CRM team was doing. It's like, oh, no. Um, so, you know, taking more of a holistic view. I, I think also, like talking to your customers, like, we don't do that enough. Uh, you know, how, much, how, how, are, how many of you are spending time, you know, go, go and spend some time with the customer service guys. Um, listening to you know what what the customers are actually talking about and and speaking to people at conferences and stuff, um, I know it's all a little bit anecdotal, but that can give you a real steer steer as well. Um, all too often we're stuck in our digital ivory towers, not really talking to anybody. And you know graphs and charts and numbers don't necessarily fill in the gaps. You know, they don't ask answer the why, and it's the why that I think. And to come back to the question, it's the why that moves people. It's the why that that creates change. You know if you can answer that and, and, and give give insights beyond just the numbers. That's that's the art to it. Perfect. And then we've got a really practical question here. Um, so mm. someone's asked, they have a client who can track really well up to the point at which prospective customers make an inquiry by phone. And to link yeah. revenue back to the source will require a lot of work, but um, yeah. they're getting the sense from this presentation that it, it really is worth doing. Absolutely. Holy moly. It would change, it'd set the world on fire with that one. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do, like definitely check out telephone tracking, like unique telephone numbers. Um, there's some really clever systems out there that will enable you to you know, set up trackers. If you've got telephone numbers on your website um, and those telephone numbers make the phones ring and, and result in, in leads and stuff, then you know, get, get that tracking in place because then we can start to draw together what's happening in the digital perspective to what's happening in the real world. I mean, this is a classic example, but I, you know, I, I'm more and more I'm seeing, gosh, every business has this. We've just become blind to it because we all think we're very digital and clever and, and we've got lots of compelling graphs and charts. But if those graphs and charts aren't measuring a lot of what's going on, we are, we're, we're, we're making some crazy, crazy blind decisions, you know, almost just making a guess at it in a, in a lot of instances. Um, so any effort you can do to tie that closer together. Uh, but, yeah, check out. There's, there's lot, I'm not going to recommend any one particular service, but there's lots of cool tracking services. And they're quite clever. They'll recycle, you know, anything up to a dozen different numbers. Um, so that they know, you know, where where those numbers have come from. And although it does create a few problems because then the number might change on the website and stuff, you just have to get 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 with it. It's, you, you can't have it always. <laughs> yeah. Great stuff. And then another question related to that. Um, so we've got a question for someone who's um, who used distributors to make their sales. So um, the majority of sales go through these distributors, which makes it hard to track sales as a KPI. So do you have any advice mm. for them on how they can measure effectiveness without seeing the sales through their own website? Yeah, so it is hard, isn't it? Because actually you're probably pointing towards other people's websites and you probably don't have access to their analytics. So one of the things I'd suggest to you, you can use, you know, UTM codes aren't going to be any good for you, particularly because they're just going to put data and useful insights into your, you know, your third parties that you're referring onto their websites. So, you know, UTM codes only go into the website's analytics. If you can't access that, it's kind of not, not very useful. But if you take the URLs you're pointing to, so let's say I'm working, for example, I might be working with Boots, for example, you know, and a lot of our sales, and I've worked with, like, um, beauty brands who you know sell a lot of stuff directly through Boots. If we're linking to stuff on their website through our social media channels, use um, a shortened URL, in like Bitly, like shorten it. Um, and actually, if you create that Bitly link in a like create a, an account with with Bitly, sign in and create the link that way. You always get a record of all the Bitly links that you've created. And also, if you log in, you start to see for all of your Bitly links how many clicks they got. So at least now I can begin to measure how much traffic has gone through to, to Boots or Superdrug or you know wherever it is that I'm sending the, the, the traffic through to. Um, that can help. Um, also, you can do like partnership marketing with them where you maybe have a, a joint um, like 
competition and you know your terms and conditions uh, agree to like share data that can help give a little bit of insight but i think the the you know the shortened url um, tracking uh, making use of bitly analytics is so underused oh oh and if you're curious about that yes you can actually use this to track how your competitors social media campaigns are, are, are going it's one of my favorite hacks um, if you want to take any of your competitors shortened urls that they've shortened on 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 twitter or facebook or or anywhere else um, LinkedIn. Um, if they're using a Bitly link, you can literally copy that link, paste it into your address bar, and before you hit return on the browser, put a little plus on the end of it, and you get a view of, of how much traffic that, that Bitly link got. It's a great little hack and actually quite useful for the benchmark. The only downside is uh, you only get 30 days worth of, of like the last 30 days worth of data, um, but that's super useful as well. So for any of you, yeah, if you not use that hack, check it out. It's interesting but yes it does mean they can do that with your links as well um it's why a lot of marketers choose to use things like hourly and uh, whatever because they do hide that that data a little bit more great stuff thanks very much um, and you talked at the beginning of the presentation um about the customer journey particularly in different stages um the care stage hmm. is something that we've been asked about in the um in the questions so someone's asked yeah. can you give an example of the content for the care stage that might be most appropriate Oh, I just like well think about people that have bought your product or they've done they're not necessarily bought they've they've done whatever the thing is that matters to you yeah you know, that thing that you're aligning everything with um what what could you do to make their journey better more fun more interesting well, I've had some great examples of this where you know I I bought a digital SLR camera and I spent weeks comparing and contrasting different models and different brands um and actually when I eventually bought the thing I went through to a thank you page um, they didn't just say thanks, <laughs> like a lot of them do. Like, oh my God, there's so much you can do with your thanks page for like converting a product, or even when people just sign up for your email. Like you get very often the, the designers just put up a little JavaScript message that says thanks. It's like whoa, what did that even happen? I I, I don't know. Like do stuff on that page that's gonna like enhance the the journey, manage expectations. Um, you know, uh, for the digital SLR camera, I I got a brilliant thanks page which said right, your, your product is going to be dispatched. We're going to be sending it to you whilst you're waiting for it to arrive. Here's some crazy, brilliant stuff you can do with it. And I had a load of videos on that page showing me all the features because they know what people are me like. like. Once I got my hands on that tool, I will not pick up the manual and read it from cover to cover. I will just jump in and start using it. So they recognize, gosh, here's an opportunity to actually teach Pete Kieran how to get more from his product. I was all over it for like three days or so waiting for that to come. It's a great example. But you know, think, think about that from your own customer journey. Like, They've bought or they've signed up or they've agreed to do things. How could you make that better? And what's great about this is it in the digital world, it doesn't need to even cost you anything. Just just a bit of time and effort to put some stuff and resources together to make people realize, oh, my God, I'm so glad that I did, I did the thing I did with these guys and not all the other hairy herberts out there touting for my business. Brilliant. Thanks very much. And just to finish us up, as we only have a few minutes left, um, we just had a couple of people asking um, for you to revisit some of the points that you mentioned, um, specifically the name of the attribution um, expert that you mentioned. And also, if you could give a quick reminder um, on how to annotate on Google Analytics and exactly where you yes. find this, then that would be great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the attribution analytics genius is Avinash Kujik. I don't know. If I, if I write this out, can you share it with everybody? Avinash uh, Q I think. Let's double check I've got that right because it's not an easy name to spell. Hang on two seconds. Uh, and let's just give you, see if I can give you, here we go. Avinash Kuzak. I'm going to share with you. So if you go to K A U S H I K dot net, uh, you can find out all about Avinash there. I'm going to share with my colleagues back at the CIM the link to this. The guys, maybe you could share that with everybody. That'd be really, really good. Yes, Can no problem that? at all. I'll share yeah, that with we'll the share person that out with everybody. And then yeah. in terms of, let me come back into my presentation, in terms of the annotations, absolutely, let's just jump back to that slide. Uh, where on earth have I hidden it? There we go. Not there, not there. Uh, I have to flip through them and find it. No, it's gone too far. Basically, under every single graph in analytics, you've got uh, a little triangular window. Oh, I'm not going to find it when I want it. No. 
Uh, let me just jump to any. Here we go. So you're in analytics, okay? Um, right in the middle of the screen, underneath that graph where it says February 2018, you will see a little grey triangle, right? And in a lot of the the reports, like it's just hidden. If you see that there, just underneath the 14th, 15th of February, that little grey. It's so understated, it's untrue, and it's so powerful. Just click on that and open it up. Yeah, and you get that wherever there's one of these graphs, you'll get that. You'll get that within your analytics. And the trick to it is, when you create an an annotation, you can actually choose to like you just go up to the little on the right hand side here, just above my email address. You can see the plus create new annotation. That's all you need to click. Um, you have to tell it the date that you're annotating, right? And when you do that, because here I've annotated the 11th of January, um, because I've put that date in there, that's where that little annotation goes. So a lot of the time when you're looking at your data, you know, you, the only, because that drawer is closed up, I can't see the annotation. I can see them as little speech marks on the actual date graph uh, line there. Um, that shows me, gosh, there's an annotation here to explain something that happened that we need to, to, to track and monitor. Uh, that's that's how it's done. If you if you check in the Google Analytics help, just search for annotations, it will tell you a lot more about it. But that's that thing. And you can make them private or public. If you make them private, only people logged in on your analytics login will see them. If you make them public, everybody with access to the analytics is able to see them. And they're super, super useful. You know, they actually reduce all that nonsense every week that we get when we've done a month on month comparison report and something's not what we expected and all hell breaks loose we try and work out well what's changed what's different why are things up or down um, you'll just know you'll just know because you've annotated um, it's well worth going through all of your emails over the last six months and annotating every single one the day they went out with email colon short snappy abbreviation of the subject line honestly that one step can really help you to to see some of the impact because guess what people don't click on your emails necessarily a lot of us We'll see there's an email, clock something's going on, and come back slightly later when it's more convenient to us. Because um, when we're in the email, we're just trying to get through all the email. There's so much of it. We haven't got time to follow up everything, but we'll clock it and come back later, either through organic or direct to the website or, or what have you. And that's where these really have their power, because they can show you what's actually going on. The correlation. Yeah, correlation is such a powerful thing. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Kieran. Um, so unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. But I'd like to say a big thank you to Kieran for presenting this webinar. And thank you very much to everyone for attending today. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. And we would appreciate it if you would provide your feedback. As a further reminder today, this, CPD, this webinar is CPD eligible. By submitting your CPD record, you not only keep your learning and development up to date, but you could achieve our prestigious Chartered Marketer status. You can also find out more about this on MyCIM or through getting in touch with our membership team today. On behalf of CIM, thank you very much for joining us today and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.